afternoon, and thank you very much for having me. It's a great honor, and I have to say I'm humbled. There's quite a few people here, a little more than I was hoping for. <laughs> uh, I think there's a slideshow rolling behind me, but it's just eyewash. Um, I don't have a real prepared talk like some of the other speakers. And one of the reasons is I came up and I met with the NCLS staff a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about what they wanted me to talk about. And they said more about myself than about the things that I thought you would have wanted. So what you see is what you get. Um, I was in the Navy for 24 years. We mentioned that. And I've been with the Defense Intelligence Agency pretty much ever since the last 21 years. I was the senior DIA representative to Korea and the deputy J-2 at U.S. Forces Korea from 2013 to 2016. I was the uh, science and technology advisor to Rear Admiral Heinbigner at U.S. Northern Command from 2012 to 2013. Prior to that, I was deployed to Afghanistan, and prior to that, I was the chief of, uh, deputy chief of the Homeland Defense Applications Division of the Defense Intelligence, Intelligence Agency's MAZIT and Technical Collections Directorate. <clears throat> I did deploy, I was a team lead, uh, an ops lead, and an emplacement team lead for our operations. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, had a small, small group of people, and so for six years I worked on the southern and northern borders, collecting information to determine patterns of life uh, and to uh, assist law enforcement in enforcing the borders and counter narcotics work. Uh, <laughs> I've done tours in Vietnam, uh, Desert Storm as they mentioned, Allied Force Bosnia, uh, the two tours in Afghanistan. The only combat theaters that I never hit were Iraq uh, and uh, Grenada and Panama. Uh, other than that, as long as I've been alive, I've been in all of them in one way or another. So let me talk a little about some of the photos here and then we can open some discussion a little bit, I hope. This is our team down at uh, Operation uh, uh, Buffalo Trace. <laughs> Not named for the whiskey, named for an actual Buffalo Trace in northern New Mexico. Uh, some of these are from Afghanistan. That helicopter is what we call a jingle bird. Anybody here done a tour in Afghanistan know what a jingle bird is? They're contract helicopters operated by the Russians for us. <laughs> yeah, they actually are. Uh, and they will fly even when there's poor weather out. When CENTCOM declares red air and you can't get a Blackhawk to take you where you want, you call for a jingle bird. <clears throat> the only thing is you have to be prepared because when you step aboard, you will smell vodka. <laughs> <laughs> Russian pilots fly lit. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a barbecue apron that our agency sells. <laughs> it's, it's got a, a, a very nice target silhouette on it. Uh, the MRAP that you just saw during one of my tours in Afghanistan, I was running clandestine emplacement of sensors on the Pakistani border in North Paktia province in the winter in 2011. Uh, and walking out with 101st Airborne, dressing like them, blending in, uh, and then in the middle of the night going and placing sensors uh, in order to catch the uh, Taliban insurgents as they set up indirect fire uh, against the FOBs and cops that we were working out of. Well, it would have been wonderful to use those MRAPs because there were rows and rows and rows of them with fresh wax jobs, but I came upon the, the groups of them and I spoke with the company commander in the FOB I was at and said, instead of walking the 10 kilometers into the mountains, why don't we ride? <laughs> you know, because I'm carrying an extra 60 pounds besides the standard ruck and, and weapons. And uh, his answer was, well, the MRAPs cost $750,000 a piece. And yes, they can withstand most IEDs. But when they do come upon one, they get damaged, and it costs a couple of hundred thousand dollars to repair them. So they sit here, and we walk everywhere we go. We're leg infantry. <laughs> Sometimes our logic <laughs> kind of bothers me. He had the authority to use those MRAPs, and he, he would not exercise that authority. And that's one of the points that I wanted to talk a little bit about was discretionary authority. As leaders, we all have some. We're, we're allowed to make some decisions. Uh, we're allowed to decide when our military members get a pass. We're allowed to approve leave. In my case, I'm the director of intelligence at JFCC IMD. I'm the J2 out there. Uh, and I can approve leave for any of my people. But I discovered very quickly I can't disapprove it. 
I can recommend disapproval. It has to go to a wing commander to be disapproved. Um, and so I know the, the boundaries of that discretionary authority in that case. Knowing the boundaries of your discretionary authority is a very important thing, but exercising it is very important too. It's like any muscle. If you don't exercise it, it will go away. You'll give it up. Every decision will be made by someone above you or by committee. Uh, as a leader, it's your job to make decisions. This talk's gonna be a little different than the one I gave at the prep school, so don't fall out of your chairs. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan the second time, I worked with a reserve colonel. Uh, she was a logistician. She'd never been outside the United States, never done a joint tour. Uh, so a lot of things were very new to her. And she quite frequently refused to make a positive decision. She could make negative ones very easily. She was, saying no is the easiest answer for a leader to give ever. Saying yes can sometimes mean taking a risk. Risk, risk taking is important. She came to me one time after she'd been on board about a month and she said, all these people who work for me, they're, they're talking about me behind my back. They go to the coffee shop at night and smoke cigars and, and I'm their subject of conversation. And I said, do you make decisions? <laughs> and she said, well, sometimes. I said, every time you make a decision, somebody wins and somebody loses and whoever loses will be unhappy and they will talk about you and you can't call them on the carpet for it. It's not sedition, it's not insubordination, it's them letting off steam. They're frustrated with their boss. <laughs> but she wasn't exercising discretionary authority. I come to find out that one of the reasons people were so unhappy with her, morale was horrible, was that she never said yes. It was so much easier to say no. No, you can't go on the convoy. No, you can't uh, man up the wall during a, a crisis. No, you can't do this, you can't do that. So easy to say no, and that avoids it. And the only other answer would be, well, take that up the chain. Because <laughs> she refused to make the decision, she refused to use her discretionary authority. As leaders, I, I wanna leave you with that point, and that is, we all have to look at how much discretionary authority we've got. If we don't know how much, we have to challenge the system. Uh, and I did say at the prep school earlier today, Someone asked me about how do you know when you've got discretionary authority? Well, you can ask, or as in the Air Force, it's pretty much spelled out. I've never seen anything more detailed than an AFI. Uh, i give you an example. I just went through a leave issue with a captain that works for me, and I had to look up the Air Force instruction on leave. Uh, I've seen the Navy instruction. I grew up in the Navy. It's four pages. I've seen the Defense Intelligence Agency instruction. It's two pages. The AFI, anybody know how big it is? It's 175 pages. I printed it. <laughs> I, I felt so sorry. I must have killed a dozen Georgia Pines printing that instruction. But it, it covers almost every eventuality that you could think of. And so you know the bounds of your discretionary authority. That's where I found out, oh, I can't approve. I can't disapprove. I can approve, but I can't disapprove. So. Uh, and a lot of times it is spelled out. And it's been my experience that if it's not, sometimes the way to find out if you're exceeding your boundaries is to not worry about it and seek forgiveness rather than permission. Uh, I had a lawyer that worked for me when we were doing our operations on the southern border. And one of the things she told me, because I was very concerned one time, we were, we were working right close to a Jesuit uh, school and the priests had declared the, the entire premises a sanctuary. We were on federal property and we were within the law and we, you know, we met all the requirements. But I still felt uneasy about it and she told me, she was a, a JAG officer, 06, and had been a, a, a prosecutor in Tucson, Arizona, and she said, the thing is, if you're pretty sure you're doing the right thing, you probably are. You can, you can ask for legal findings all day long and it's not gonna beat your intuition. If you don't think you're doing the right thing, you probably aren't. And therefore, you need to stay away from that. Uh, and I've taken that advice. It served me pretty well. Uh, I will be retiring 31 March, knock on wood, <laughs> provided I don't exceed my, my bounds of authority and do something that gets me retired earlier or worse. <laughs> um, so some of the other pictures. Let's see, we've talked about the MRAP. 
Uh, these are supposed to just be eyewash. That's myself and my little Greenberry buddy, Mike Summers, and we are teaching the 101st Airborne how to use some of the very expensive sensors that we put out in the, uh, in the bush to blow up in Afghanistan. <laughs> Uh, this is what you do before you eat in Afghanistan, every time before you eat. You go into a mess hall, those are, every, every mess facility has them. Uh, rows and rows of wash-ups. This is just outside the wire at Kandahar Airfield. Uh, that's my cool guy picture. I don't know who got that, but uh, when they called me and said, we pulled some pictures off the web that we want to put up for your presentation because I refuse to put up a PowerPoint because some of you are already starting to nod. If I had a PowerPoint up, you'd be in a coma. <laughs> uh, but they pulled some pictures off the web and I said, wow, I didn't even remember putting those. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about discretionary authority. One of the other things I want to talk a little bit about, and then I want to open up some questions, maybe give you a little more history, a little more mark, <laughs> if you will. Uh, another philosophy that I have that has served me well as a leader uh, and a manager is that people want to do the right thing. We talked about this at breakfast, my, my two escorts and I. <clears throat> Everybody in the world gets up in the morning, and it doesn't matter if you're EDMN, um, Osama bin Laden, who you are, you believe in your mind that you're going to be doing the right thing. Almost everybody. There are a few people in the world that are truly evil. There just aren't very damn many of them. I've seen a couple. My ex-wife is one. <laughs> <laughs> But I haven't heard, seen, seen or heard from her in over 42 years because we managed to seal the gates to hell and keep her pinned up. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody thinks they're, they're doing the right thing. Everybody believes in what they're doing. Everybody, whether you're a Taliban fighter, an, an ISIS militant, uh, a, an Air Force officer, uh, a Navy enlisted man, you believe that you're doing the right thing. Some of us get swayed. As the day goes on, we, we meet with some frustrations and, ah, let's screw this. Let's do something else. Uh, some of us get bought, you know, by someone, someone else who thinks they're doing the right thing. You know, we, we get tempted or coerced. But if you assume that people believe they're doing the right thing, it gives you a different perspective when you try to deal with them as a leader. When you look at someone and you go, Okay, so you want an extra 21 days of non-chargeable leave that you're not entitled to. Why would he think that he should get that 21 days of non-chargeable leave? Well, it's because he read the instruction wrong and he's reading it to match his narrative, you know? And he believes that, that he's being wronged if I don't give it to him, okay? Well, <clears throat> I have to manage to keep him a motivated individual and give them the, the bad news that, no, you don't rate it, and I can't give it to you. And even if I could, I wouldn't. Uh, so it, when you deal with people, you have to try to understand that they believe they're in the right. Uh, I get occasionally baited into discussions online uh, by some acquaintances of mine, politically motivated discussions. And I, I know the conclusion is going to be a stalemate because I am never going to convince somebody online to change their mind. <laughs> it's hard enough in person. And they believe they're right. It doesn't matter if I throw fact after fact. They're absolutely sure that the stuff I'm giving them is made up. So to deal with them, I change the subject. So knowing that people believe they're doing the right thing, let me see if I made another note here of any kind. Uh, I'm one of those guys that does a lot of work before I do something like this. So last night at 6 o'clock, I started writing my presentation. <laughs> at 6.30, I threw that away and opened a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> and I wrote a bestseller. <laughs> and I sold it to a publisher, so I can't use it. Uh, Let's see. Um, one of the things that, that follows with that is that truly noble and heroic people are around us every day all the time. And you say, well, that's not true. I've, I've seen a few heroes. I've had the incredible good fortune to know three Medal of Honor winners and actually work with one of them for a while. Uh, and 
I've worked with heroes my whole life. I've walked with them, talked with them, eaten meals with them. Um, but what I came to the conclusion was, was these were people that were placed in circumstances or had opportunities that other folks didn't have. And that the, the fellow sitting here with his fingers in his mouth, <laughs> he's probably a hero. He just hasn't had the opportunity to show you, show you yet. Um, what I asked him not to put in my bio or put up here was my first 11 years in the Navy, I was a UDT SEAL. I asked him not to put that in here specifically because the minute that I say that, you won't hear another word I say. And that's pretty sad because I'm actually a former UDT SEAL. I'm a professional intelligence officer and have been for over 30 years. I'm a PhD, a father of three. I've been shot, set on fire, and beat with a stick. I've got all kinds of health issues. I have cancer right now, and I'm told that I'm untreatable. Uh, so I'm retiring on the 31st of March. Uh, I don't believe I'm untreatable. We'll see. <laughs> uh, but all you're going to want to ask me about is, the, and the last group did the same thing, is what SEAL teams were you on? Where were you stationed? What was your favorite thing to do? I'll answer those right now. I was on SEAL Team 3 and 1, and I was with Naval Special Warfare Group 1. Uh, I was with SEAL Team 3 Detachment in uh, Subic Kui Point, Philippines, and Subic Bay. Uh, I was a foreign materials uh, recovery team uh, member, not, a, not even a, a lead. Um, what was my favorite thing to do? Peel and stick door charges. Uh, managed to fit 10. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that you know, 350 pound door flew about 400 feet before it hit the ground in pieces. <laughs> and all I could say was, wow. <laughs> um, so we're past that. Let's, let's talk about some other things. Um, in the intelligence community, some of the things that we do, the secret to our success is the secret of our success. We're not allowed to talk about it because we'll give away the source and method. We won't be able to do it again. If I am listening to your phone conversations, and you find out about it, what are you going to do? You're going to mitigate it. You're going to either change phone numbers, get a new phone, guard your conversations, not put out things you don't want heard, or feed me disinformation, which is even worse. Um, so we don't talk about our successes. We try not to talk about our failures, but every time anybody fails, it's an intel failure. Just read the newspapers. <laughs> we're, we're an easy blame, and we don't care. We don't mind at all. Blame us all you want. So every time you blame us, Congress gives us more money. <laughs> so go ahead. Call an intel failure. I dare you. <laughs> we'll be taking TDYs to the Bahamas on you. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> the secret to our success is the secret of our success. And so a lot of times we're not able to talk about it. But I have a number of, of operations that I've participated in over the years that I can talk about and I'd love to share with you. But I'm not going to just spit them out. I'm going to ask you to ask me questions. Uh, I'm going to make it just as hard for you as it is for me, because I'm not a professional speaker, and I don't normally do this for. In fact, this is probably the second largest group I've ever spoken to. <laughs> I have lectured at Yonsei University and Seoul National to lecture halls with 80 kids in them. Um, and I discovered how PowerPoint works. It's actually a sleep aid. <laughs> Because, I, like I said, I could have you in a coma in two minutes with PowerPoint. But let's, let's open it up a little bit, and then if, if I don't get enough questions, I'll, I'll try and engage a little more. Sure, go ahead. Yes, I come from the law enforcement community, and as I have moved up, um, my information that I have to make decisions on comes from other people. So the validity of that, it, it makes me sometimes uncomfortable. When I was a patrol officer, I was right there, right there in the moment. I could see what was going on. But now, and to be honest about it, I'm in charge of internal affairs, so the information comes in from all different places. But I don't have first-hand information initially. And so I'm just asking, I'm imagining your information may not have been first-hand either, but you still have to make a decision. You can't sit there and wait forever and ever and ever and ever until you get more information, more information, because there's always going to be more information. But that has become tougher as you move up. And so I'd just like to know how you Certainly. Um, I don't have the answer. I, have, I can share what I know and what I do. 
And you're absolutely right. As I've moved up in the intelligence world and, and I am farther and farther removed, right now my team follows missiles around the world. Modifications to them the, this morning, uh, about half the team was detailed to a special project to follow some weapons transfers overseas. <clears throat> we don't get this information firsthand. In fact, we're lucky if it hasn't been through three people before we get it. Uh, so it, we have to determine source credibility. And we have certain sources that over time we've learned to pretty much trust, and other ones that we don't trust. And these are within our own community. They're not even, you know, it's not like we're interviewing a, a, a CI or somebody like that. It's, this is our own National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and if we get something from St. Louis, we know to call the folks at our strat and verify it. <laughs> because we don't trust St. Louis. They rotate their analysts too frequently. They make a lot of bad calls. So you do have to develop a, a level of trust based on your, your history with your sources. If you don't have a history, then you have to try and vet them through uh, another user. Uh, and I do that a lot. I, I don't have any problem at all. I don't feel a bit of shame or, or like I'm new at this. I've been in this game 46 years. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I will call the IA headquarters in a heartbeat and ask another person that I know and trust, hey, what do you think of this? I got this report out of Japan that says, you know, Godzilla is coming ashore. <laughs> and, and, you know, here's what the source was on it. And he'll tell me, you know, no, that was Mothra. Forget <laughs> it. You know, don't worry about it. But, but yeah, there's, there's probably another, a bunch of different ways, but those are two, two of the ways that I deal with it, because I have to deal with that every single day of my life, uh, getting stuff third hand and not knowing whether to trust it. Uh, and quite frankly, probably about one call out of five, I'm wrong because my source was wrong. Uh, it, it is, in the intel community, you kind of get used to damaging your credibility on a regular basis and having to rebuild it, because that's what happens when you make a bad call, your credibility goes plush right down the toilet. And then you have to try and rebuild it. Uh, you have to make people trust you again, because you want to be able to, to speak that truth to power, to tell those commanders what they need to know so that they can act on it. They can move troops, they can you know, launch defensive systems, all that kind of stuff. Did I answer your question or did I avoid it? No, you answered it. It's just tough because, as I said, working in internal affairs, you can't really let out some of that stuff because the other part of it is people will not tell you it's supposed to be all confidential too. Yeah. So it's hard. You know, and, and I think, yeah, that's oh, a. I don't care. I'm always going to be known as the rat squad. But somebody has to do it. Yeah, I, I, I almost missed that you were working internal affairs. I worked with the the, the DHS IG uh, because our sensors unfortunately <clears throat> detected some activity that wasn't necessarily foreigners, but was a violation of federal law. And I had to work with them on those. And I realized the additional complication of it being. Uh, held extremely confidential uh, and not been able to vet it externally. Uh, so I, I don't have a good answer for that. I wish I did. Uh, sometimes you just got to go with your gut. You got to do what, what you, and, and like, like the attorney told me, if, you are, if your intuition says you're doing the right thing, you probably are most of the time. Go ahead. Uh, so you said that most people believe that or are, want to do the right thing. So how do you get someone to see when they're not doing the right thing that they are doing, that they, that they aren't doing the right thing, or that their definition of the right thing isn't the correct definition? Well, first I'll, I'll say <clears throat> the, the hardest thing to do in that situation is to avoid confronting them. Because if you confront them, you make them defensive of their position and they will never accept a change. The best way that I've seen it done, and I've done it myself, is to draw them to the conclusion on their own through questioning. Uh, you develop some questions that will draw them to a conclusion that they've made a mistake and that they should actually look at something differently. Let them make the conclusion. Do not assume that because someone's got something wrong that they're not smart enough to come to that conclusion. They're just as smart as you in most cases. Uh, an academic credential doesn't make you smart. Uh, you just are or you aren't. Uh, and me, I'm in a room full of smart people. I'm the only one here that's probably not. 
So, <clears throat> I mean, that, that seems to work for me. Uh, and I don't know if it'll work for you or not. What do you think? Ah, so you came to that conclusion on your own. Good for you. <laughs> well, anybody else got something that they want to talk about? Yes, please. Uh, sir, there's uh, future intelligence officers in the crowd here. Obviously. No. <laughs> and. Uh, they're several years from going to the schoolhouse and going through the programs. In terms of things uh, that they can do now, in terms of uh, maybe getting the analytical years going, what would you recommend for them to do um, in the meantime? Or activities or things that you did that you thought were extremely helpful uh, as an analyst later on? Well, I don't know. Uh, if, if they can do this or not. I'm a compulsive reader. Uh, I read the backs of cereal boxes, comic books, anything I can get my hands on, and that has always done me very well. Uh, by reading two or three newspapers a day and multiple news feeds, I stay quite current on what the open press is saying. Um, now, the closed sources, we were talking about this earlier that, you know, the the Classified sources that we use are frequently much more accurate uh, than, the, than the open sources. However, that frequency is less than you'd think. I mean, if, if CNN shows us a picture of a North Korean missile rolling down the road, guess what? In the intel community, we steal that picture off of CNN because we're never going to get a close-up that good. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, staying current with the open sources is a good thing to do. Studying a language doesn't hurt a bit. Uh, I can tell you the three most popular languages the DIA is recruiting for right now, uh, and we're competing with CIA, because they want them too, Urdu, Pashtun, and Dari uh, are the three most popular, which I don't think you'll find a lot of courses for those here, because <laughs> they're really hard to come by. Dari is spoken in Western Afghanistan, Eastern uh, uh, Iran, and Urdu and Pashtun are spoken in, uh, Pashtun is spoken mostly in just Southern and in, uh, Eastern Afghanistan. And Urdu is spoken all over the country. Uh, Pashtun is also spoken in Waziristan and Kashmir. So that's a very, very popular language for us to, to recruit for. But Russian's always a good one. Uh, I'm, I'm a Korean linguist. I'm a 5-5 native speaker. Uh, and I read it and write it. And uh, I also speak Vietnamese uh, and Thai to a certain extent, uh, enough to get myself in trouble. <laughs> And I can say a few words in Tagalog and a few other languages. Having a language is a, a good thing to do when you're entering the intelligence community. It doesn't hurt a bit. It doesn't mean that you're going to work in that language specialty, necessarily. But if you're like me, when you least expect it, they will come and grab you. Uh, I have done four tours in Korea. Uh, and the latest, latest one, 2013 to 2016, I had absolutely no idea I was going to Korea until the director of the agency called me and said, Mark, I want you in Seoul in two days. <laughs> and I said, really? For what? <laughs> You're going to be the DIA senior rep to Korea and the deputy J2 at U.S. Forces Korea. I said, well, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, language is, is very helpful. Um, but they will get a payback when you least expect it. And does that answer as best I can? Because there isn't a lot else you can do. Uh, there are some areas of study you can look a little bit into, radar physics, understand coherent change detection. Uh, you can look at uh, image sciences is a, is a big help. Uh, understanding multispectral and hyperspectral imaging, uh, which is actually not imagery at all, but I won't debate that in, in here. <laughs> it makes all the image scientists really angry. Um, understanding si signals intelligence and signal propagation doesn't hurt a bit. Uh, Everybody who goes into Intel thinks they're going to be the next James Bond, okay? <laughs> and we don't really do that kind of work very much, uh, inserting, uh, at least at DIA we don't. We, we do not insert covert operatives. Uh, instead, we just recruit ones that are already there and we run them as case officers. That's what our human people concentrate on. We have two pieces of the human service. That's the Defense Clandestine Service, DCS, and the Defense Debriefing Service. The debriefing service, comes and visits me every week, because every time I speak with a foreigner, they want a complete debrief of that. 
uh, any foreign contacts that I have, any foreign contacts anybody in my command has. And then <coughs> um, the Defense Clandestine Service, uh, we run, we have case officers that run agents. I tried to do that once. I'm really not good at it. Uh, so I gave it up. I did, I did technical intelligence instead, and I was really good at that. And all source is the cup to sip from. <laughs> when, when you start doing all source intelligence and you start actually making a difference in decisions, uh, somebody asked me earlier, of, of all the people I've met over the years, because I've met a president, I've met a number of other people, um, <clears throat> who, who was the most impactful? And I had to say it was Condoleezza Rice. I briefed her uh, on a, when we captured a North Korean submarine on the take, the intel take from it. Uh, I got to go to Washington and see her in person, and she was incredible, scary smart, uh, heard every word I said. She might not have believed it all, but she heard every word I said, which is really unusual. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, that all source intelligence piece is just marvelous to work in because that's where you, that's the level you're going to get to work at. Uh, if you're doing specific source directed stuff, you're never going to get to see people use it. And that's the other thing about when I worked with law enforcement, that was the most fulfilling intel that I ever did was working with Border Patrol and ICE and DEA and Coast Guard and, and FBI on a couple of occasions uh, because the law enforcement guys gave me instant feedback, loved everything I gave them and asked for more. <laughs> and I got to watch on my own sensors when they threw people down and handcuffed them. It was incredible. It was just wonderful work. Other other folks got anything? Yeah, please. Uh, you said you like to read uh, this um, is there a certain historical uh, figure whose philosophy and writing is particularly spoke to you? Thomas Jefferson. And if I try to go into that, we'll be an hour just on that subject. <laughs> Jefferson was, a lot of people know of him, know a little bit about him as uh, a master of all the science of his time uh, and that sort of thing, but he was quite a philosopher as well. And uh, reading his letters, uh, I can, uh, there are books out there of them, and I can read them all day long. I, I really love Jefferson. No? Okay, well, let's talk a little bit more then about, let's see. I don't have any more notes. I'm, I'm out of those. Uh, you like the porn star mustache when I was standing there in front of that's a 1970s issue mustache in uh, 2012. I want you to know that. I, I, I preserved it in a freezer. <laughs> Actually, I used to grow that every year. I ride a Harley. Uh, yeah, it's an old one like me, but it's a lot of fun. And so I used to grow it every year and about this time of year. But I went through a bunch of chemo <laughs> earlier this year, and I'm not sure that it would even come out right now because this is barely there. <laughs> and, and uh, so, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so you talked about how in the intelligence community specifically, it's all about you know you're continually losing your credibility and having to build it back up. In a more wider perspective, um, with dealing with failure, what is your best advice for upcoming cadets, um, upcoming Air Force officers on how to deal with failure and to regain that credibility with their peers when they face failure? Okay. Well, I do have a, what I think is a really good answer for that. And I still feel guilty. I don't think I gave you a very good answer to your question about uh, source credibility. But the, the answer on dealing with failure is to face it up front, get, it, get out in front of it. Uh, every time that we try to avoid the punishment or the shame or whatever, we just make it worse. Uh, I have a whole series of what I call stupid mark stories. I'll tell one in a couple of minutes if we don't come up with some more questions. And you'll see what I mean. But it's my way of getting out in front of things. I would much rather tell you about something that I did that was a horrible mistake uh, and get a good laugh out of it than I would try to hide it and have you find out about it later and hold it over my head. Uh, so dealing with failure, get out in front of it, admit it, deal with it. And for example, if you do something wrong, uh, I it, just about three years ago, I had an ANPVS-14 uh, night vision monocle, monocle, excuse me. <laughs> I almost said monocular, but that's what it is, it's monocular. 
um, laying in a box on my desk. I had issued it to someone, taken it back, and then I was using it for an operation that we were doing in Korea because uh, I liked the monocle better than the, than the night vision goggles because it only makes you blind in one eye. <laughs> when you, I don't know if you've ever used a night, night vision device. When you turn on a nod, it uh, lights up, a big bright green light. So whatever eye you have that thing over, you're going to have no night vision in that when you take that off. So you save one good eye for night vision and one for, for using the night observation device. Well, I put that thing on top of a cabinet in my office in a skiff. Anybody in here unfamiliar with a skiff? Do you know what a skiff is? Everybody knows? Okay, so I won't go into it. Uh, but you would think it's it, a it pretty safe place to leave something like that. And it grew legs and walked away. When I discovered it was missing, I went right down to logistics. I said, I'm signed for this. If we can't find it, I want you to do a statement of charges. I want to pay for it right now. I do not want someone coming looking for me after I retire. I got out in front of it. I admit it, it was my fault. I, I was the one who left the thing unsecured. It was a highly preferable item. They cost about $2,500. Well, it was my wife mad. <laughs> They're gonna take what out of your check? <laughs> but yeah, I, I lost it and I couldn't recover it and I couldn't figure out who took it. Uh, so I paid for it. I got out in front of it. When you make a mistake, own up to it. That's how you deal with a failure. When I make a mistake, I'm a, I want, uh, I work for a, a two star in uh, Stratcom, that's my supervisor, but I'm really subordinate to a three star uh, general, Lieutenant General Dickinson is my boss. I'm his J2. And uh, so when I, when I make a bad call, and I do, do that probably once every two weeks, I am on the phone with General Dickinson before anybody else. I don't call his chief of staff or anyone. I call General Dickinson and I say, sir, I, I shot an Intel product up to you and it was wrong. Okay, and here's what was wrong with it. We got additional information and, and so this, this wasn't you know, the, the tell that I told you it was, uh, which makes a big difference in how the Chinese are employing it or whatever, whatever the cause is. I want him to hear it from me. I don't want him to read about it in the paper. Uh, I've been on the receiving end of that. As the senior DIA representative in Korea, I had 500 miscreants that I, I was responsible for. And there was nothing like having uh, the SOFA representative from the uh, 8th Imperial Army JAG office call me up and go, do you know you have a guy in jail? <laughs> and I would go to my deputy and say, hey, I just got a call. He says, yeah, I know about it. I didn't want to hear it from the JAG. I want to hear it from you. <laughs> uh, so I, I know what it feels like to be surprised with a failure. And it's the worst thing that can happen. You get out in front of it every time. You will never be worse off for that. So I think that's pretty much what you wanted from me on that. Sure, go ahead, please. or the defection that just recently came to light. What do you believe of the intel agent to Iran? What do you believe the biggest failure was that allowed something like that to happen? And what do you feel is the biggest, or what is your biggest fear from that happening? Let me start off with what we believe internally, because I'm very familiar with internal threat. The insider threat is our greatest counterintelligence threat. Vince Stewart, Marine Three Star, was our agency director uh, prior to General Ashley, who is our current agency director. And he conducted a review of DIA. We're 16,000 employees, and we estimate we're about 3% penetrated. That's a rough estimate because we don't know what we don't know. When I was working with law enforcement, we originally were going to work with local sheriffs and uh, 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 special investigators, and we came to the conclusion, at least in Texas, that they were 20% penetrated. So we're penetrated, we know that. And what was the failure that allowed her to go back to Iran uh, and to be passing all the information she was passing? In, in DIA, uh, and, and in most of the services, we do require polys 
we do a special background investigation. Uh, you know, all the services in DIA do special background investigation, which is a very in-depth investigation. We have training on insider threat. We know what to look for. We know that the employee that stays late and comes in early every day isn't just dedicated. He's probably making copies of things. Uh, we know that the person who just bought a new boat uh, and is making payments on a Bentley on GS8 salary <laughs> is probably doing something untoward. Uh, so we know what to look for. I can't tell you what failed in her case. Uh, and I don't know if it was a failure. You know, sometimes everything we can do won't stop the bad guy if they're, if they're dedicated enough. And the reason that I, I say that is we penetrate them and everything they can do has never stopped us. We're successful on, an, on a scale that I couldn't even talk about in here. We're very successful. I, did I answer it? Yes, sir. I'd love to know if I hit the target. <laughs> I'm a member of a range here in town when I shoot. Every time I, I run a, a, a magazine through my gun, I bring it back and I look. I want to see, I want to see where everything went. <laughs> Nobody else has a question? Oh, please, go ahead. Uh, what's your approach to, uh, I guess, gaining leadership and respect with, when you're put in charge of the group so when you're put in charge of a, a, of a group that has different cultural differences, where uh, it's harder to see from their perspective, what's like some general approaches that gets you in? Okay, I, I get it. So when you're put in charge of a group where there's a great cultural divide between you and them, I got a story to go with that. Uh, 1976, I think it was. The Navy was trying to take on more FID missions. That, that's the Army's job, Foreign Indigenous Development. Uh, and their Green Berets do that very well. They win the hearts and minds and they train other militaries and all that kind of stuff. Na Navy Special Operations, we blow shit up and we swim in and take pictures of you and that's what we do, okay? <laughs> we kick down doors. Uh, and in the Army, only Delta does that. They're the only ones that do a lot of direct action. But we wanted to do more FID, so I got sent being that I'm not a Spanish speaker, although I've had some training, uh, I got sent to Honduras to teach patrol tactics to the Honduran military. Thank God they sent a Terp with me because I could have never lived without him. But I had to learn to eat the way that their Hond Honduran military ate, which is a, a real unusual bean paste <laughs> and no tortillas. Uh, I had to learn to drink their coffee, which is like crack cocaine. It's some of the best coffee in the world. It's incredible. Uh, and it's got enough sugar in it that I'm sure that's what caused my diabetes. Uh, but at first, I went in and I was trying to teach them, and I, and I was showing them how to rest step and how to you know, quiet walk and things like that. And they were just all over the place. They were just scattered. They were miserable. And I was yelling at them and doing the things that were done to me. And then I realized that that wasn't working at all uh, because they had a different mindset. They were all older than I was, for starters, by a year or two, not by much. But there's a very specific cultural thing in their mindset about being older. Uh, so what I had to do was rely on what a human's greatest strength is, our ability to adapt. So I couldn't adapt them to me, so I had to adapt me to them to get my point across. And to this day, they still can't march in a straight line, but they do know how to keep from leaving too much sign behind. Uh, so the, how, do you, how do you do that? You adapt yourself to their culture, not the other way around. Uh, especially if there's a greater number of people in one culture. Uh, let's say, um, let me think of another instance. Let's say I'm working with the Afghan National Army, okay? And there's a, there's a group of them that were trained in the U.S. and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to work with them, teach them how to do intelligence preparation in the battlefield. <sighs> maybe not teach them, maybe work with them to build an, an IPB. Well, there's eight of them and there's one of me. So how's the adaptation going to work? They're, they're going to adapt to me? 
No, I'm going to adapt to them. And I've had to do that, actually do that, in Korea quite a bit. Uh, I've had to learn to adapt to the Korean way of thinking. For example, they have a philosophy about kibun. Anybody in here know what kibun is? In China, they call it chi. Okay, it's the inner self, your inner peace. And if I go into a watch repair office and I give him my watch and I say, I need this fixed, it's Wednesday afternoon, and he looks at it, and in his mind, he knows he can't fix this watch at all. But if he tells me that, he'll injure my kibun, my inner peace. So he says, okay, I'll have it fixed for you. When do you want it? And I say, I need it by Friday night. Okay, I'm going to come back on Friday to try and pick up my watch because he said he could fix it. Now, why would he say he could fix it? Because he doesn't want to injure my kibun. He doesn't want to upset my inner peace at this time. He'll wait until later uh, and allow me to enjoy a little inner peace. So foreign to us because as, as Americans, we believe, and I think we're right, bad news doesn't get better with time. <laughs> it doesn't age like fine wine. So I'll go back on Friday and he'll say, oh, I, I need parts not here until tomorrow. <laughs> he'll try to give me another day of peace before he tells me that my watch is a goner. <laughs> but you have to learn about those, those pieces of their culture and you have to adapt to them and understand them or you can't get along with it. And, and that's how, when, it, when I have to deal with a significant cultural difference, uh, even in Americans, and it, there are some of those. We, we have cultural dif differences in our society. I take a look around and say, can I adapt to this? Because if I can, it's going to make life a little easier, or, or at least understand it and learn to deal with it. It's going to make life easier. Uh, if I can't, then <laughs> it, it gets confrontational, and confrontations have one result one winner, one loser, and that's never a good thing to have. So uh, adaptation's a better way to go. Anyone else? We're out of time? Thank God. <laughs> you guys are all off the hook now. <laughs>